We're going to be looking in the book of 1 Samuel. I'm going to try to concentrate on chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, but I will be looking also into the first part of 1 Samuel to try to bring clarity on what's going on. I'm somewhat afraid of how this is going to turn out because I'm, I've shared it on you before. I'm a new preacher and it's hard for me to take notes. But again, I'm not afraid because I believe in preaching from my heart. And I believe that God will have to give it to me in my heart until I'm able to steady myself and put it on paper. So I ask that you would pray for me that God's will will be done. Let's look at chapter 3. And it reads, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. And it came to pass at the time when Eli was lying down in, in his place, and his eyes began to grow dim, that he should not see. And before the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and, and Samuel was lying down to sleep. And the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. And he ran unto Eli, and said, Here am I, for thou call, callest me. And he said, I callest not, lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I call not, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And the Lord called Samuel the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth me. Today is Youth Sunday. And I wanted to share something with the youth. And it's going to be a lesson for all of us, even as adults. But I want to talk about church children. You have a calling on your life. Church babies. You're a little different from outsiders or non-believer children. You have a calling on your life. And the calling on your life uh, has nothing to do with your lineage. It has something to do with God. And God all by himself. God has stepped into the lives of believers and changed their hearts as it relates to the children that are born into families. And I shared with you, I told you that I will I'll be looking at some other, looking at a, the uh, verses, uh, chapters 1 and 2 uh -huh. of this to give you a better understanding. But when he has impressed upon the lives of believers in their hearts, they understand in the institution of marriage that bringing forth children is not just a pleasure, right. but it is a charge so to speak, and it is a gift, and it is one to be greatly honored. See, because unbelievers can come together in a marriage, or even not being in a marriage, and bring forth children into the world. But when you understand as believers the gift 
that God has placed in you, you don't just have sex and bring forth children. You pray them into this world and you dedicate them unto the Lord. For you see, this is Samuel when he was very young in age. Samuel was prayed into this world. For his mother, Hannah, was a barren woman. Hannah also was one of the wives of her husband. And she was somewhat jealous and grievous that she could not bring forth children into the world. So grievous that she had went before the priest, Eli, I believe, and she prayed so hard and she was in such great lamentation that he considered her to be drunk. He considered her to be, he said, why do you come here like you are drunk? And she said, I'm not drunk. I have great travail because I want a child. And God heard her prayer. And that's how Samuel was conceived. He was prayed into life. And she made a vow. When you read it in, in chapters 1 and 2, she made a vow. If you would give me a son, I will lend him back to you. And that's why I say he was a church baby. He was different. Well, some people have their children. We'll dress them up in the finest clothes that we can get them in. We'll make them look good. We'll try to get them on their best behavior. But the unbeliever won't lend them back to Christ Jesus. And when we lend our children back to Christ Jesus, we're ultimately talking about dedicating him back or dedicating them back to Jesus and raising them in the admonition of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And when, we, when this child, Samuel, was lent unto the Lord, again, in chapters 1 and 2, if you would read, you'll find out that the husband and Hannah would come to the priest yearly, and they would pray to the priest and ask what they will in order to get what they needed for their everyday life. And when the child was conceived, even after the child was born, the husband reminded her that it's time that you lend this child to Jesus and give him to Samuel. The mother said, not right now. I'm going to wait until he is weaned. This is the bringing together of the church and the family. Because, Samuel, because the mother said, I'll wait until he's weaned. And... and to not to get too graphic, she was breastfeeding her child. Right. And when you look at a child being breastfed, a relate, not only is this child being fed physical food, but also a spiritual bond or a connection is being brought between that child. Because they know the natural affections of a mother and her child. The breastfeeding will, is given strength in the body that will help that child fight off certain diseases and illnesses. That child tends to learn faster, be more astute, right. because he's getting what's nourishing that God has intended. In other words, this was not going to be a Similac baby. This baby won't have the chemicals put in its body that possibly, that possibly would cause brain damage possibly even cancer, or an inability to function in a normal state of mind. And I know that that's scaring some of us, but that's what happens to us when we fall away from the natural convictions of Christ Jesus. The natural affections of parents to raise their children in a natural way. But we've become so educated that we feel like we can make some milk better than what God has intended for the baby to actually have. Pastor, I normally wouldn't talk this way, but you just preached over at New Birth today, and I, I, I'm stronger now. I can tell it now where the rubber meets the road. But we've become so educated that we've missed out on all of the good pleasures that God has for us. And it's because, just like the, speak, the rapper said, we don't even know it. 
But this child, once this child had bonded with the mother, she had opportunity to let this child know that I'm not going to be with you always. Well. Neither will your father be with you. But there is one that we have prayed to and chosen to lend you back to that will bless you and take care of you more than we could ever do. And she had to have that time to teach that to that child. And I often said, well, why wouldn't it be the father that teaches that? But the Bible even teaches us that it's the women that ought to teach the little children. It's usually the godly women that is the first teacher of salvation to the children. But men, you can't escape because it is you who solidifies the teacher, I mean the, the mother. Uh -huh. We have to be on one accord. Yeah. What she doesn't understand, because the Bible says that the woman should, be, should learn in silence. Yeah. And I know that that's almost impossible. <laughs> but it's not as what you seem. Yeah. If you have a loving husband, and if you have a situation that you're learning in Bible study, and you have a question, learning in silence isn't just saying, shut up and don't say anything. Uh -huh. It's saying that your husband should address the issue. Well. And I'm getting way off of where I'm supposed to go, but I'm talking about family. It is your husband should be sitting right next to you in Bible study. Amen. Because truth of the matter is, no husband should want his wife to go to any other man. Uh -huh to get a spiritual guidance. It's you as a husband, so you're held accountable as well. And if you don't understand her question, then it is you who approaches the pastor. Am I right about it, pastor? I'm just trying to get this thing in order because it is the husband's position and it is the wife's position to stand together in order for this church baby to be right. Amen. But then now this church baby has been lent unto uh, the priest. Uh -huh. He's been sent to Eli. Now he lodges with Eli. The parents would come yearly and bring a coat and they would pray and they would ask alms of God and then they would check on the child. But they realize now he belongs to Jesus Amen. and here that's when we get off into the meat of the text well, he was there living with him and the Bible says that Samuel and the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli all right. now that's a great thing that you have to remember because it's, it's going to show somewhat what we consider contradiction or possibly contradiction when you read verse 7 but this child ministered unto the Lord. Well, let me go to verse 7 to kind of get you started. It says, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. And I wondered how could he minister unto the Lord and he didn't know the Lord. Because the first thing that went through my mind was, that's just like saying a sinner that don't believe in Christ coming in off of the street. How is he going to minister unto the Lord? But again, we're talking about church babies. I was here in your earlier service and I saw children praise dancing. I saw them singing in the choir. I saw them clapping their hands and spreading great joy to all of us seniors in the house today. That's ministering unto the Lord. And I said, now I understand what's going on. Children minister unto the Lord when they're church babies. And what I'm saying is, you bring that baby to God. You dedicate him, and you let that baby sing. You let that baby dance. And you let that baby do everything that he's supposed to do in the house of the Lord. He may not understand or know who Jesus is. But in due season, Jesus will call him. Church babies have a calling on their lives. They're not like anybody else's children. And when you bring them into the house of the Lord, don't muzzle them. Don't hold them back. 
you let them sing the way they want to sing. If that baby mess up the words of that song, don't you stop him. You let that baby alone because it's a perfect praise. Children really are the examples of how we ought to be. Have you noticed when children do what they do and they make mistakes, they never stop? It doesn't even matter to them because they're not doing it just because it's them. They're doing it because they have no inhibitions. They don't mind doing it. And that's how you and I ought to worship on the, uh, every time we come into the house of the Lord. I know that I stumble in my preaching. I know that I don't know it all. But it doesn't bother me because I know my heart is right. I know that I'm trying my best to keep my eyes on Christ Jesus. And it, I know that failures will come and trials will come and things will get difficult. But the children are our example. Whatever happens, it's going to be all right. I've seen them run down the aisle and fall and get right back up as if nothing happened. But when I fall, I'm embarrassed. I'm ashamed. I'm subject to lay there and play. I'm like I'm hurt so I can get some sympathy. And then maybe again, I just might be hurt. But the children are our examples. And that's why we ought to love having church babies. Because church babies are the ultimate teacher of the adults. You know that's, that, that's a sad thing, but it's a true thing. We end up learning from those who we ought to be teaching. But then again, I'm not going to let them get all the credit because they will have a time in life where they will make mistakes that we have to nurture them. We will have to correct them. We'll have to put them in order because they will make those types of mistakes. But here this child was ministering unto the Lord in the house where Samuel, I mean where Eli was. And then we look at Eli. Eli had biological children of his own. And the Bible talks about his children. Now his children wasn't quite, they were in the church house, but they really weren't church babies. Eli's children were cut-ups. And since I have sons, and since I am an Eli, well, Pastor, I'm going to throw you in as well. Since we have sons, and I see them here today, I want to tell you, do not be like Eli's children and bring rottenness to the bones of your parents by acting the way Eli's children acted. It is rottenness to the bones. It is injurious to the pastor and to the mothers when the preacher's kids do what Eli's children did. Eli's children were so bad that I'm not even going to speak against <laughs> what they did. But don't hurt us that way. Because you'll find out if you study about Eli, not only did it hurt Eli, the children had to pay as well. And can you imagine preacher's kids? They used to always tell us the preacher's sons are the worst ones. Can you imagine the damage done when your father preaches an uncompromising gospel? He holds his house together, his wife, she provides for you in the home, and then you go out and cut up as if you've never even heard of Jesus Christ. And it also hurts us like it hurt Eli here when you study it, when he has someone that cares for him in his old age. And it's not even his blood. Because that's what Samuel ended up doing. Samuel ministered unto Eli because Eli was getting old. He couldn't get around. And he was feeble. And his children were not there for him. So he had to depend on Samuel. And we thank God that we have Samuels in our lives today. We talked about, I heard you talk about it earlier, of how when we get old, we need someone to take care of us. That's left into the hands of Christian believers. So it's very imperative that we teach a true and an unyielding faith and a love for God. Because when we get old, like my parents have taught me, 
Once an adult, twice the child. When I was born, I needed someone to comb my hair when I had it. And as I get older, I'm going to need somebody to take care of me when I get older. So we have to teach our children and, and give them over to God like Samuel. Again, we're going to look at Samuel. Now, Samuel was a child, a great worker in the church. Samuel had a room which some say was a closet next to Eli's room. He laid down for, and four times his name was called. And he was under the impression that it was Eli. Samuel, he said, what is it? And went to the room. And Eli said, it wasn't me that called you. He asked again and again. He asked three times. And I know I, it's rare that I can get you to shout. But I want you to understand what's going on. I'm not going to try to make you shout. If this word doesn't make you shout, you on your own. But he called him three times before Eli perceived that it was God calling him. He said, Sa he said Samuel, and he would go in again. He says, it wasn't me. That's what our children do to us in the church today. Our children work in the church. Now they're going to be taught in the Bible study. They sing in the church. They praise dance in the church. And they're going to grow up and become adults. Amen. And of sooner or later, God is going to call their names. Amen. Now, if you've been good to your child, if you have taught them in the ways of the Lord, they're going to believe that it's you talking to them. You don't get it. When God begins to speak to them, they're going to believe that it is him who has been speaking to them. When I was a child and I accepted Christ Jesus, I didn't understand salvation. I believed salvation. But I was older when I began to understand salvation. And it's all right. I was saved when I first believed. That's faith. It's not what I know or what I understand. It's all about the cross work of Jesus Christ. But I learned about Jesus Christ through my father and through my mother. And these children learn about Jesus Christ through you. So when God starts to speak to them, they believe that it is your voice. Well, let me, let me flip the script since you're looking at me this way. There are a lot of adult children in the church on today. You've been in a church singing, praying, even teaching. But when the voice of the Lord speaks to you because you're still spiritually immature, you don't understand if it's him or not. We believe, because you've been paying your money, that doesn't mean that you're spiritual. Just because you hear every time the doors open, that doesn't mean that you're spiritual. You see, some people will come to us, Pastor, and tell us the Lord told us. And we'll justify it by saying, I know it was him because I pay my tithes. And I pay more tithes than anybody in this church. So I know the Lord told me to tell the pastor this. That's a spiritually immature child. And the reason I say that is because when we get down to the bottom portion of the scripture, when he told him to lay down, and when the Lord called, you say, Lord, thy servant hears you. Amen. Notice it's not, Lord, my child hears me. He says, Lord, my servant hears you. What is it? And what he's saying is now I've matured. I'm no longer a child. I'm no longer the one that's just singing and praying and, and dancing and being on the earth. Now I'm a servant. Now I've matured to the point to where I know I can handle talking about Christ Jesus in the church. Now I'm matured. I'm a servant. I'm ready to go outside and work and tell people about Jesus. That's when you know that you have matured. And that's when Samuel knew that he was coming into himself. And notice that Eli directed him to it. 
and it brought anguish on the heart of Eli to even tell him that it was the Lord speaking to him. Because earlier in the scripture, it said that Eli, because of his sons and his inability to get them to turn from their wicked way, that God was not speaking to them as infrequently as he would always talk to them. So what's going on, it anguished him. Because when the Lord started to speak to Samuel, he knew that his time had been cut off with Christ Jesus. And it was because of his ineffectual affection and his ineffectiveness to tell, tell his children to get themselves together. He had a portion in his heart where he allowed them to continue on. And he was refusing to rebuke them or chastise them. So it brought anguish to know that now Samuel has come of age. Your days have been numbered. And now it's time for me to get a word to all of the people of Israel. Because the Bible said he began to bless Israel through Samuel. And through Samuel's faithfulness and his dedication unto the word. And again, I noticed that you hadn't shouted yet. But you just don't know how close to the end I am. Now that Samuel has become of age, he has shown us as adults the, the role that we ought to take in our lives and the progression that we ought to have as believers. Look at this church baby. This church baby has come in and been humble throughout the entire situation. This church baby, when he did get out of line, he had a Samuel there to say, don't do it this way. Don't do it that way. He took wise counsel because Eli was his pastor. Amen. And when you submit yours, it's easy for a child to submit themselves if you start them off right. I've learned a long time ago, if you have a child that doesn't know anything, it's easier to teach that one than one has already been corrupted. So when she dedicated him back unto the Lord, it was because he was pure and ready to be taught the unadulterated word of God. And Eli was there to teach what was right, even though he had failed in teaching it to his own biological children. And I thank God for a church like Third Avenue, that when you walk in these doors from start to finish, I believe because Jesus is in this place, the word of God will be spoken and taught in all truth. And, and, and I came by the other day and I was in your Bible study and I found something out. The teaching in your Bible study ain't different from the preaching in your pulpit. You know, that, that's, that's common in this day and time. You go to some folks' Bible study, if they have a Bible study, it's short. It's, it's, it'll tell you just about anything, but if you come back that Sunday, they'll be preaching something totally contradictory from what they have read in the Bible. But I thank God again for a third avenue because I know when I get it wrong, I have one that loves me. I have one here that will say, do it this way, do it that way, get it right. And, and I'm not being selfish. I know how he, he will deal with his own children that are members here of Third Avenue Christian Church. Because I've told you there's a relationship between Eli and Samuel, and it's all based on Christ Jesus. And, and I'm, I'm here at my close now. The relationship was formed by Jesus Christ. All relationships in the church house are based on the love and affection of Jesus the Christ. And do you know what love is? Love is at the cross. Your pastor just said it today when he was nailed to the cross. It wasn't the nails that hung him on the cross. Because if I did a research on the nails that were used on the cross, the nails on the cross had hooks on them. So when a person was hung on the cross, his hands were this way, then the hooks held him on the cross. But now I tell you that that day when Jesus hung on the cross, the nails could have been turned down, the hooks could have turned that way, and he still would have stayed on the cross. Really, nails were not needed to hold Jesus on the cross because Jesus 
was on the cross because he hung there by his love, his affection. Nothing could bring him down off of the cross. And, and that's why I rejoice now knowing that God was on the cross for me because he loved me. God was on the cross for me because he wanted to die for me. God put all of our sins on the cross for us. And that's what we ought to be shouting about because God has taken care of his church babies. God has even taken care of the church people. And do you know when he took care of you what he's done? He'll take you out into this world and, and that's when you'll share that love with those that have not been church babies. You, you know, you can be adopted into the church now. You don't have to be born into the church. You can go out, you can be in a world of sin, but God will adopt you and he'll adopt you with his blood. And it has to be a blood relationship and that that's why he shed his blood for all mankind. He shed his blood for all of your sins. And now we're adopted into the family. Because some of us have looked here today and said, well, I'm not a church baby. But because of his blood, yes, you are. Because of Jesus and all his love, you're a church baby now. You're a church adult.